Today I'm going to talk to you about uh, sedentary behavior. Uh, and I think this is a really uh, interesting and exciting topic to talk about because um, it's only in the past few years that there has been a focus on sedentary behavior. Um, you know, over the last 50 years we've talked about physical fitness uh, and then we've started to talk about physical activity from a public health point of view. Um, and to the extent that we talked about sedentary behavior, it was telling people to stop watching TV or not watch as much TV as they do. Um, but in the last, I'd say, five years even, uh, five, six years, there's been some interesting research coming out that's challenging us to perhaps think about sedentary behavior uh, in a different way uh, and to even think about it as being independent from physical activity. So we might need two messages, one to promote uh, more physical activity and another one to encourage reducing sedentary behavior. Uh, so that's what I'm going to try and take us through today and hopefully we can come back and talk about it at the end. Um, but before I do that I want to introduce you to one of my friends, uh, the Tyrolene Iceman. Has anybody, Otzi, anybody heard, remember Otzi, hands up? Okay, uh, got five, six, so good. So, um, Otzi here was found in the, in the Swiss Alps, uh, bordering on uh, Italy. Uh, he's, he's mummified, um, and uh, he died about 5,000 years ago. Uh, and um, some of the interesting things about it is when they, they you can see his body it was almost completely intact. Uh, fingernails still there, teeth. Um, and so they were able to do analysis of his, his body and they could even determine, his arteries were still intact, so they could determine um, how he died uh, and what else he might have experienced uh, as, as he lived. So one of the interesting things is the, he, they most likely think he died from uh, an arrow wound uh, up in the uh, shoulder. Uh, but he also may have been injured and then died in an avalanche. So they're not sure exactly, I don't think yet. But what I wanted to point to was the, um, the fact that he had vascular calcifications. Basically, his arteries were clogged. Um, and if he didn't die from this arrow wound, he probably was going to die from a heart attack or perhaps a stroke. Uh, he was 45 years old. Um, he had uh, fairly severe arthritis. He had suffered several other injuries uh, over the years, broken bones and the like. Um, so the interesting thing here is often we talk about, um, you know, people from the past, from five, ten thousand years ago, and compare ourselves to them and say, well, we're less active and less healthy than they were um, in some respects. Obviously, they were challenged by infectious disease and uh, and just trying to survive in fairly harsh conditions. But Otzi was a uh, a product and a victim of the m first major cultural uh, revolution or evolution that occurred, and that was the agricultural revolution. Um, he had become much more sedentary than his ancestors were, uh, and even though he was walking a heck of a lot more than we probably were, he was starting to suffer some of the consequences of being more sedentary than, for instance, hunter-gatherers from five, ten thousand years before him. Uh, here's another friend of mine. This is actually my maternal grandmother's great-grandfather, John Vernal. Uh, he uh, lived uh, in the second major cultural re uh, evolution, and that was the Industrial Revolution. So he lived during the time the invention of the steam engine. By the end of his life, he would have traveled uh, by railroad. railroad um, and he lived to the ripe old age of 82, which was pretty good at that time. He died in 1857. He was born at the beginning of the Revolutionary War uh, in New York State. Um, so he lived to be uh, in his 80s, but for much of his life he suffered from gout and he died of congestive heart failure. Uh, so again, those are conditions that we would associate with uh, a sedentary lifestyle. Uh, so these two individuals lived through what uh, uh, many anthropologists would argue are the two major uh, transformations that occurred for us in terms of our living and our living standards, the agricultural revolution uh, and the industrial revolution. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that a little bit later on because I think it's very important for us as we talk about sedentary behavior and physical activity, uh, basically ways of expending energy uh, 
we need to understand that in the context of, a, of an evolutionary perspective. Um, and so, um, you know, if we go back to that prehistoric time, our genes were selected for a very different environment in which we now uh, live, and a different environment than which Otzi lived, and a different environment in which John Vernal lived. Um, we evolved to be in an environment where there was not a lot of food, and we had to go out and find it, and we had to move to do it. And we would be sedentary to recuperate and to rest, but we didn't have a lot of opportunity to do that. Now we have a lot more opportunity to do that. Uh, and as Wright says, uh, we basically have 50,000-year-old uh, hardware, uh, but we're operating 21st century software on it. Uh, and that has resulted in some challenges for us. And it's what Gluckman and colleagues call this mismatch hypothesis, where uh, you know, we were designed for a different environment uh, than we currently find ourselves in. OK, so before I move on, I want to uh, provide a couple of definitions for some terms I'll, I'll use here. Uh, so first of all, uh, the metabolic equivalent. So METs, basically the cost of doing work. Um, so uh, one MET is what <coughs> most of you are probably expending right now um, as you're sitting. Um, and if you get up and move around, you'll expend a little bit more energy so your MET would go up. So just think about that when I talk, and I'll, I'll refer to it a few times here. But the MET is basically a cost of, of doing work. Uh, and one med is, is where you'd be if you were being completely sedentary. Um, light activities, this is sort of an older definition now, but light activities would be considered less than three mets. Um, uh, moderate intensity activities would be three to six mets. And then vigorous intensity activities would be over six mets. Uh, and I'll come back to that one too in a second. Um, light or low intensity activity, and I just wanted to, to bring this up because of the fact that I'm going to differentiate with sedentary behavior, uh, would then fall somewhere probably between 1.5 to 3 mets. I just showed you light activities were less than 3 mets, but uh, um, light activities would qualify now as being between 1.5 and 3 mets. Um, often are not part of our physical activity guidelines. Most of our guidelines have focused on moderate to vigorous physical activity, uh, but yet they probably account for most of the activity that we do through the day. Not necessarily most of the energy expenditure, but most of the activity we do during the day. Also may be referred to as spontaneous physical activity or non-exercise activity. Uh, and if you know anything about uh, Levine's work, James Levine's work, it contributes to non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which basically is one source of energy expenditure. Uh, and the idea, and Levine makes this case, that it's different from exercise. It's that sort of low-grade activity uh, that we spend throughout, they spend throughout the day, ambulating, standing, moving around, doing tasks of daily living, that type of thing. Uh, and he argues that it's that source of energy expenditure that is probably more important in terms of understanding things like obesity than exercise would be. Uh, and the interesting thing here is you're probably, and we are not as aware about that, um, uh, how much we are doing those or not doing those types of activities. Uh, and he can differentiate between, in this case, a group of lean individuals and a group of obese individuals uh, to the order of 350 calories a day, just depending on whether they were standing and emulating more or less than, than someone else. Um, so this is an interesting one, and this is one that I'm quite intrigued by because I do a lot of work examining how the environment influences our behavior and our health. Uh, and I would argue that this is where the environment probably has much more impact on us than on that exercise. Richard was able to get in his car and drive to wherever he got beamed by a fastball the other day. Uh, that was very planned and they knew they were doing it. But how we move around, sit around, how you sit in here today um, is heavily influenced by whether there's a chair or not here, for instance. Um, okay, so that moves now to sedentary behavior. Uh, and this is why I was pointing out the differences with the other two things. So sedentary behavior in its uh, most recent definition is defined as activity where you're expending uh, 1.5 or less METs and in a sitting or reclining posture. 
So we've got an energy expenditure component to it, and we have a posture component to it. So just expanding less than 1.5 mets does not qualify as sedentary unless you're sitting or reclining. Uh, and this has been proposed by uh, the Sedentary Behavior Research Network. Uh, it's a group of researchers that have come together and they're trying to push for this differentiation uh, from that light physical activity. Uh, and they're encouraging researchers and practitioners to be, to be using and thinking about this. Now there's a couple implications here. There's a measurement implication now. Um, you know, if we uh, uh, give people a questionnaire and ask them to fill out a questionnaire and ask them if they're watching TV or not, we need to now ask them if they're watching TV while they're sitting down because you can watch TV while you're standing up, for instance. So we need to know both about how much you're moving around and whether you're sitting or standing to qualify as sedentary behavior. So this presents some challenges on a national level uh, when we're measuring, doing population surveillance. We use devices that we can put on you to, to determine how much you're moving around, but they don't tell us whether you're sitting down or standing up. Um, so that's one thing that I'll come back to. Okay, so 1.5 mats sitting and standing. Uh, so uh, that comes from a, a bunch of research, uh, some cool ones where we put people in chambers and determine how much oxygen they're consuming and, and how much energy they're expending. And you can see that, uh, that this is fairly, uh, as I told you, one met would be you sitting down and that's, you can see the one met line here. Um, this is uh, whether it, when you're fasting and then this is uh, uh, non-fasting, uh, sitting and watching TV. Uh, typing seated and reading seated. The other interesting thing that comes out of this is there was a theory at one time that there was some effect of consuming screen, particularly watching TV. It was almost like we went into some sort of a Zen state and that our, our, our basal metabolic rate was suppressed as a result of doing that. But this shows us that there is that, that effect is not there. Whether you're sitting watching TV or sitting reading, you're expending the same amount of energy. So it, the issue now becomes sitting as opposed to the more specific behavior of reading, watching TV, playing video games. Uh, and I think that's gonna be an interesting discussion point from a public health point of view. Um, and in fact, these researchers would argue that the 1.5 met actually might be a bit too conservative. Uh, they're saying this is pretty well where sedentary behavior is at and that we might be listing out on some lower intensity activity that would fall in here. So again, another point for debate later on. Uh, and then in terms of the standing, uh, we can see that if people are using a standing desk versus a sitting desk, that uh, yeah, they're at um, you know they're they're uh, up over that one range, but they're falling below that 1.5. This is this is calories per minute, uh, which is uh, for about a 60 kilo person, this would be equivalent to a um, a met expenditure. Um, so this is very similar to a met indication. So you can see there definitely is more energy expended if you're at a standing desk versus at a sitting desk. Okay, so uh, that's our definition of sedentary behavior, where our cut points are. How do we measure sedentary behavior? And I talked about this a little bit before. Well, we can either use objective measures, so some little device, gadget, an accelerometer, a device that measures our movement in several planes, a pedometer, which measures, well, pedometer measures steps, but technically we can't use a pedometer to measure sedentary behavior. Uh, again, I could talk about that a bit later on. Uh, so you can have accelerometers and then you can have these inclinometers. They actually measure posture. They measure the angle of the hip relative to uh, the torso so they can determine whether you're sitting down or not. And in fact, if we go by that Esperin definition that I mentioned before, that is the only way we can measure sedentary behavior apart from walking around and watching people, technically. Um, or we can do self-report stuff or parental report. Um, and uh, you know, uh, I'm willing to discuss and talk about the, the limitations. I, I'm, I've, I started out and have used self-report for a long time, and I believe there's pretty good reliability in self-report. The validity is suspect, but now that we're starting to talk about things that people might not even aware of they're doing, I think there's some challenges in using it here. The trade-off on these two is there's a high, huge cost with trying to put devices on a bunch of people. How do you sample 20,000 people with a device that costs, you know, between 200 to 1000 dollars that's a pretty expensive proposition right um, and so for our big large surveys we still tend to use our big large studies we tend to use surveys um, 
So those are the ways that we would measure behavior. Whoops, I gotta watch that trigger. Um, okay, so what are we recommending to people um, in terms of sedentary behavior? Canada is on the forefront of establishing guidelines, both for physical activity that differentiated across age groups for physical activity, um, for different groups, different clinical groups. We have guidelines uh, now in the areas of uh, people with disability, multiple sclerosis. I'm part of a group that's establishing a guideline for uh, people living with Alzheimer's. Um, and we have established guidelines around sedentary behavior. Um, unfortunately, we do not have any guidelines for adults. We only have guidelines for children. Uh, and guidelines are based upon what is out in the literature. Our guidelines are based upon systematic reviews, so very extensive reviews are informing these guidelines. Um, here are the guidelines for the early years. Uh, Val Carson is here somewhere, a colleague of mine. Uh, she and I were on the, the writing group for the early years guidelines. Um, and uh, these were the first guidelines established in the world. Uh, there are other countries that were working on guidelines, uh, but we were the first ones to actually publish on them. Um, the guidelines make distinctions between uh, infant, toddler, uh, and the young child, um, and they recommend that uh, the child is, that when the child is awake, that we try not to restrain them too much, um, that uh, as they're getting a bit older, that they're consuming no television whatsoever. Uh, and then by the time they're in two to four years, that one hour per day. Um, and I can tell you, being part of this group, we had parents who were part of our team and there was lots of discussion and we are very aware of what the implications of this are. Basically, um, you know, for up to two years, your child should not be consuming any screen time at all, uh, and then that two to four year old should be watching one hour or less. Uh, so the babysitting device, uh, the calming device, whatever you wanna call your screen time, uh, is sort of a no-no. Um, and so we were definitely hearing from people, do you realize how this is gonna change my life? Um, so, why why are there only screen time, apart from the restraining stuff in here, why do you think there's only a recommendation around screen time here? Any thoughts why? Back of the room? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Anyone else? Why do you think, though, that we only have a recommendation on screen time? Screen time catch your attention, but go think back to my definition for sedentary behavior. If these are sedentary behavior guidelines, pardon? Yeah, and basically, as I mentioned to you before, these are based upon systematic reviews. So we are at the mercy of the studies that have been done before, and the only studies that have been done uh, with well, just about almost, and not only just with children or children this age, have focused on screen time. But given the new definition, we need to have more of a focus. Yes, there are benefits of reading. Yes, there's benefits of other things we can do while we're sedentary. But uh, we need um, more research now to be done. And that's going to happen. It's just the nature of where the research was at the time. So you'll notice now when I move to the next age group, again, it's all it's uh, sedentary. It's screen time, which is the major recommendation that we're dealing with. So for the five to 11 year olds, I'm not gonna show you the, the, the youth age group, the 12 and ups, because it's basically the same recommendation. Uh, so now we're saying two hours or less, uh, and that was the case for, yeah, five year olds too. Two hours or less, and then limiting um, uh, sedentary transport and so forth. So when you look at the guidelines, um, you, you need to understand that just about every single word in the guidelines are weighed relative to what we feel we can say confidently based upon what's in the research. So as the research matures, you will see these guidelines start to, to change. Uh, um, I, I'm fairly confident of that. And the original screen time guideline that was with the pediatric societies and associations was not about sedentariness, it was about consuming violence on TV. So the, the time, this two hour thing was dictated by concerns about exposure to violence and other 
types of stuff on TV that you did not want your children to watch. So when this, the health researchers came along, they just adopted the two-hour one. So as a result of that, we have tons of studies that have measured that particular cut point uh, out in the, in the uh, population. So I suspect that will start to change a little bit too, where it's being driven more by the sedentariness as opposed to, we don't really care what the content is on the TV from our point of view. We just don't want you being sedentary while you're watching it. Um, here's another potential guideline or a cut point to throw into the mix, and this is, I was part of this with Katrine Tudor-Lock in, in um, uh, sort of reaffirming this idea of there perhaps now instead of having any one specific type of activity um, recommendation, this one was a step index, and Katrine, if you know her, uh, she is the pedometer queen. Um, and she publishes tons of stuff on steps and so forth. Uh, and in this one, we put um, sedentary lifestyle on a continuum relative to a physical activity lifestyle, and 5,000 steps or less per day uh, seems to be fairly consistent with any other indicators of sedentariness, sedentary behavior, um, both from a, um, the, the physiological effects the, the risk for chronic disease uh, and the accelerometry and inclino inclinometers, when we correspond those with it, if you're taking less than 5,000 steps a day and you're maintaining that over a time, you are basically leading a sedentary lifestyle. Um, and so this one is potentially a little bit easier to measure than whether you're sitting all the time. Basically, to take five or less thousand steps a day, you are sitting quite a lot. It, it's, there's only so many hours in the day, and it, it correlates pretty, pretty well with that. Okay, so um, I've told you a little bit about what sedentary behavior is, how we might define it. Okay, so how does this now correspond, uh, well, A, with what are we, how much are we doing, engaging in it, and how does it relate to our risk for uh, chronic diseases? Um, well, so if I only had several slides to show you today, this would be one and its companion one that I have after this. Uh, I really like this slide because I think this encapsulates, encapsulates um, uh, you know, one of the main messages that, uh, that I want to make today. And uh, I, I suspect some of it won't be a surprise, surprise to you. So what this is showing is uh, our energy expenditure and the sources of this energy expenditure over time. This is from the U.S. Uh, starting in 1965, and now it's projected out to 2030, and here we are at the point when this paper was published. Uh, the different types of activity or the sources of activity on here, this is uh, occupational activity, the big, big one here. The, the darker one is domestic-related activity. Uh, the uh, white one is travel. Then the uh, lines are your active leisure, so sport, exercise, uh, that type of a thing. And then the black line is sedentary behavior. Um, and this is, is, is in met hours, so just look at this as energy expenditure uh, over per week. Um, so what you can see is overall there's a decrease in energy expenditure. Um, and you can even see that the magnitude of the different types is shrinking. So our occupational uh, activity, uh, this is the U.S., so it would correspond pretty well for Canada. Um, you can see that that is shrinking and projected to account for probably a smaller proportion of our energy expenditure over time. Uh, the interesting one is the active leisure is probably not really shrinking all that much. We've actually done a pretty good job of engaging in active leisure. Uh, it's all the other sources of energy expenditure that have decreased dramatically. Um, and that goes back to uh, Oatsy and uh, my, my great-grandpa, John Vernal. Um, and what's happening at the same time is we're increasing our sedentary behavior. So this would be another one that would suggest, okay, these two kind of go together, but they could also be somewhat independent. Okay, so that's for the U.S. Here's China. Now the scale is going to change. Uh, it's the same, uh, it starts in 1991, but if I just back up here a second, if you look at the met hours, uh, the sedentary time was up to 40-something 40, 40 hours here by 2030, and the met hours were up at the 250s here, uh, starting in 65, whereas China is starting at 400 in 1991. So a lot more energy expenditure, one in China, but you'll notice almost no active leisure whatsoever, and the vast, vast majority is occupational-related. 
as I said, the scale has changed. So this domestic one looks smaller than it does on the other, but it's actually larger than it is on the, on the other one. But at the same time, they are projecting out uh, a fairly um, even steeper incline or slope on the sedentary time. So this is alarming in China, and there's one for India which is even more stark than this one, uh, because it's happening, it took us a couple of hundred years or several hundred years to start to make that shift since the Industrial Revolution. It's happening on a much, much uh, quicker, faster timeline in countries such as China and India and in some other developing countries. But no question, as we are devising, coming up with new technology uh, that, you know, we just knock off a step or two steps per day, uh, and our biology loves that. It pats us on the back because it's preparing for that day when we won't have our abundance. Um, similar graph here, this is from the U.S. Uh, looking at occupational, specifically occupational related activity. So the nature of the occupational activity, the intensity has changed over time too. As we've moved away from more blue collar type work, uh, you're seeing a decrease in moderate intensity. We don't have a high intensity on here, but you're seeing a decrease in moderate intensity since the 1960s and an increase in the light intensity and a uh, now coming on strong increase in the sedentary. Uh, they've defined it as less than two mets, um, but uh, so we've seen a, a real shift within the workplace in terms of the intensity of the type of work we're doing. So we're not m lifting, cutting, chopping, uh, you know, moving around as much in the workplace as we used to. Okay, so what does that look like at a population level? Okay, so this is data for Canada. Um, uh, the first two are from something called the CHMS, the Canadian Health Measures Survey. Uh, this one is a population-based survey where we did put those little devices, those expensive devices, on 10,000 Canadians. It costs us uh, millions and millions of dollars to run that study, uh, but uh, you know we're one of only a few countries in the world that have that type of data, and it has really given us some insight on things. For instance, the correspondence between self-reported BMI uh, and actual measures of BMI so body mass index, um, uh, you know, we're, we're able to look at that now because we're doing measures and we're also doing self-reports. Uh, what it also gives us is physical activity and sedentary behavior or sedentary time because we have accelerometers on people. Um, so in terms of this is just the number of minutes sitting, that's the scale here. Um, and so Canadian males and females, males sit a little bit less, about uh, 20 or 30 minutes less per day than females do, but it's uh, somewhere between 550 to 600 minutes a day. So somewhere between nine and a half to 10 hours a day, we basically sit on our butts. Um, this is from a, a, a little study that uh, was run for one of my graduate classes where we put uh, all sorts of devices on a, a, a select few uh, uh, sample at U of A, and these are mainly people who are around the Faculty of Physical Education and Recreation. There's, some, there's at least one triathlete in here. There's several people who we know work out a lot on a daily basis. One guy who's trying to, to row a boat, apparently. Um, and uh, so these are people who are much more active, and sorry, on here on the red, I have the, the moderate to vigorous physical activity. That's the minutes of it. So on a Canadian level, we're just under 30 minutes uh, for males and females. So this sample was up at 60 minutes. So that's twice the recommended amount that uh, these guys are engaging in. Uh, but you can still see that they were up at five, this is around 540 minutes they were still sitting. So they were twice the amount of moderate to vigorous physical activity that needed to do, but they're still sitting for uh, nine to 10 hours a day. So one argument would be is increasing moderate to vigorous, vigorous physical activity is probably not going to be the solution to reducing sitting. Obviously, while you're running around, you can't be sitting, but you are not going to do 10 hours of moderate to vigorous physical activity a day unless you're in, you know, uh, the, the marathons, the, the ultra marathon type things, and even that is not potentially sustainable. And then the last one I have on here is a sample of Jamaican uh, rural agricultural workers. Unfortunately, I don't have the MVPA, but these guys are doing 300 minutes of sitting a day. So they're, doing they're sitting 50% less than the Canadians and even potentially than our uber athlete guys from U of A. Um, so that tells you what the potential is out there. 
uh, the, these agricultural workers, these are guys who are working in cane fields. They're doing a lot of chopping with machetes and they're doing a lot of manual labor. Uh, it would represent probably where we as a society would have been about 150 to 200, probably even 200 years ago. Okay, so that's adults. What about children? All right, uh, minutes sitting, three to four year olds, uh, somewhere between 300 to 400 minutes. And then our girls, six to 19, are getting close to uh, their moms uh, in terms of how much they're sitting. Moderate to vigorous physical activity, uh, pretty good there. The levels, these are the minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. Uh, you can see that that slowly starts to decrease from the three to four year olds to by the time we get to uh, you, our adolescence. Um, and that sitting time is increasing as we age. Very typical pattern. I could be showing you this from Australia, the US, Western Europe. We would see a very similar type of pattern there. So um, we're sitting a lot. So that results in us. I'm part of the writing group for Active Healthy Kids Canada report card on children's physical activity. Uh, and we do a grading, like a, you know, a school report card. Uh, and in terms of sedentary behavior, we have given nothing but an F over the years. Uh, and so this is the percent now who are meeting the various guidelines. You'll see that the percent changes because we move from that one hour requirement for the, uh, the three to four year olds, bumping up to two hours for the, the five uh, and youth. So you'll see a bit of a jump, but then it, it comes back down to the, by the time we get up, up to the youth. Um, so we're, we're not happy with those patterns. Uh, all right, so uh, I've told you how much we're doing. Um, and so now what's the evidence for why we should care about this? Well, this is probably, I would attribute this study by Genevieve Healy out of Australia as being one of those significant ones. Why I was saying about in the last five years that we've started to look at this more. This is coming out of something called the Oz Diab. It's a big diabetes study in Australia. Uh, and what Healy and group did was they showed us that, uh, so these are various different um, uh, health uh, indicators, health factors here, waist circumference, body, uh, uh, body mass index, glucose, and uh, triglycerides. Uh, and you can see across here the same sort of pattern just about in all the cases where the, these are quartiles of sedentariness. So the, the first quartile is the highest sedentary and the fourth quartile is the lowest amount of sedentary behavior or time. You can see the same pattern going across all of these. Basically, those who were the least sedentary were um, you know, better off in terms of waist circumference, uh, fasting glucose, triglycerides, and so forth. So this was important because it showed us this, I said, like this kind of quartile effect where we can see this very nice kind of linear patterns. And they were challenging us to be thinking now about, wow, you know, like maybe we need to be decreasing sedentary time. Uh, and that we can get a, a, a fairly substantial difference. These are significant um, uh, effects here. Uh, and so what does that uh, tell us? Okay, well, if we look at chronic disease now, so your risk for the disease, because those are some of the mechanisms uh, by which you might be getting these diseases. Um, uh, I like these studies here. These two on the left side come from one of my favorite all-time studies, which is uh, the Morris studies from the 1950s, where he looked at, you ever hear of the bus driver and the conductor studies? Uh, very simple in a way, but an excellent control in that, you know, in London, where you have the big double-decker bus, you have a driver and then you have the conductor, and the conductor has to walk up and down those stairs all the time to get the tickets from individuals when they would get on the bus. Uh, and Morris documented a big difference in terms of risk for and even the severity of myocardial infarction between the driver and the conductor. The cool thing here is it controls for social class and there was a real class effect in the UK and even today there is to some extent still. Um, so it controlled for social class. These guys were all from the same background. The only difference is one walked around and collected tickets all day and the other one sat on his butt and drove the bus. Uh, and that is I would say the sort of uh, forerunner to the sort of modern day physical activity and health epidemiology uh, uh, area and probably um, uh, why many of us are even here today would be those studies. Uh, and you see the same kind of patterns across other studies. This one is with women showing uh, more sitting time, higher uh, risk and mortality for cardiovascular disease and the myocardial infarctions.
So these are some of the things, again, that started to, you know, when we look back on them, are making us think about them a little bit. They wouldn't fit our current definition, probably, of sedentary behavior uh, in the, the, metabol the, uh, the energy expenditure component and the posture component may not be there, but they're, they're sort of pointing in the same direction. All right, so that's led uh, some to conclude that, you know, we're taking years off our life, so these kind of quotes are always uh, useful. Um, uh, people want to know, okay, how can I quantify these things? But it might be on the order of a couple years off our life from sitting. So if we stood up instead of sat down, you know, maybe at, uh, down the road you might be uh, wanting a couple more years. You know, it's like if you're a Toronto Maple Leaf fan and you're worried that you may never see them win a Stanley Cup again. <laughs> You should start standing now because you might need a couple more years. Yes, guy in the background, he's already doing it. <laughs> um, all right, so I've told you about sedentary behavior and, and much of that stuff. I haven't made a case yet for why, as I mentioned at the beginning, that how it could be independent from physical activity. So all we needed to do in Jerry Morris's case, we just need to exercise those bus drivers and boom, we could reduce that risk for myocardial infarction. Well, there's some research that's even challenging that, that not just exercising that bus driver was necessary, that it may also be the act of sitting down. There may be something about sitting and a physiology about sitting that's not ameliorated or addressed by getting up and running around. And so this study by Patel, a large uh, study out of the US, it's based on self-report data, so one potential limitation here. But what this study shows um, is I've got uh, total physical activity, so these are met hours per week, so again, indicators of energy expenditure on the bottom, with the, the one on your left being the highest energy expenditure and the one on your right being the lowest energy expenditure group. Uh, and then I've got multivariate, this is risk for all-cause mortality, all right? So the higher up you are on these bars, uh, the higher your risk for, to die, basically. Um, and then what is in the bars is actually time spent sitting. So what you can see here is this nice, beautiful little pattern it replicated across all the energy expenditure groups in terms of an association with risk for all-cause mortality. So even if you, this guy, these guys here, these are your marathon runners. These are people who are training all week in terms of energy expenditure. But yet, even among them, you have, if you, sit, uh, if you sit more than this guy, you are at more risk for all-cause mortality. Um, and then where it really becomes a whammy is if you're not very physically active, so down in these groups, then you, and you sit on your butt, then you're, uh, that's a real double whammy. So that's why I say this study, oops, I want this one. That's why I say this study started people to be thinking, okay, well, wait a minute now. There may be two things going on here. Just by being active, we have not completely eliminated this risk for mortality, um, which is shown in this group, or this group, or these groups. These, these people are being physically active. They would meet our physical activity guidelines, these people. But within them, there's variation on their risk depending on how much they sit. So this is one that you'll see cited a lot in the literature about making us think about, oh, okay, uh, maybe there's something going on. And so that's where a guy named Mark Hamilton, he's sort of the leader on this stuff, is talking about this idea of the inactivity physiology. So we have exercise physiology, and maybe there's another physiology called inactivity physiology. And the idea in here is that it talks about unique uh, and separate from the responses of structured exercise. So uh, there is something that may be going on about sitting and being sedentary that's unique and cannot be addressed by just getting people to exercise more. So again, this comes down to this issue of posture versus energy expenditure, and it would have informed that S-burn definition that I mentioned to you at the beginning. Okay, so what do we see about this? Well, some of the stuff we're seeing is aberrations in insulin sensitivity, tri triglycerides, uh, HDL, so the good cholesterol, we're seeing lower. The LDL, the bad cholesterol, we're seeing increasing. Uh, impacts on glucose and sens um, insulin. And then, um, you know, bed rest. A few days of bed rest is not a good thing. So you couch potatoes or, you know, uh, if you like to lay back and watch your hockey game over and over again when the Habs win, um, you, you're already putting yourself at risk. Uh, you'll see fairly quickly 
uh, loss in bone mineral density and muscle mass. If you're not using it, you lose it. Uh, the body, these things are really heavy for your body to carry around. So if you're not using it, your body starts to say, let's get rid of it. Uh, I'm more concerned about supporting the brain and I don't want to waste time on these guys here. So uh, fairly rapid, acute effect of being sedentary uh, and these are the potential mechanisms for those slides I just showed you before in terms of chronic disease risk. All right, so let's talk quickly here about potential interventions. Um, uh, and this is an area where a lot of my colleagues work in, and I would say that, and this is a meta-analysis, the, the point up here, is that when we look across all the studies that have tried to do interventions, this was for uh, children or young people, as they called it, children and youth, they basically found a small impact or effect um, of the interventions. So it was significant, so we are able to change uh, sedentary behavior. The majority of the studies in here, I haven't looked at the studies, but I can guarantee you just knowing the nature of the literature, the majority of studies would be uh, targeted at trying to get children to watch less TV. So given the definition I've given you, I think we almost need to throw this literature out or this information can be set aside and we need a whole new set of studies that are going to be targeting how we get kids to stand up. They could still watch TV. Um, again, the pediatric society or whoever might not be happy about that or other public health people not be happy about them consuming the TV, but technically from our point of view, we don't care about them watching TV, we just need them to stand up. So if they could be, you know, as an adult, if you could be running on a treadmill while you're watching TV, that's great. Uh, but if you just stand up, that could be all we need you to be doing um, to uh, ameliorate the effect of being sedentary. And that is where the shift is going to occur now and the research is being done because we don't have much apart from that Healy study and a few others around how that works. But anyway, um, so if we're going to try and look at the center of and this is my own musings now up here, uh, I think given my argument going from the beginning of that we have these fairly powerful biological drivers, uh, a change, a substantial and dramatic change in the environments in which we live, that the, the sort of the theoretical constructs, the things that we need to be looking at to understand behavior are going to be things like automaticity. So automaticity suggests that there's things that we're not necessarily aware of that we've become maybe even habituated to uh, that are influencing us. Um, uh, intrinsic motivation, to the extent that we engage in activities like TV and video games and so forth, uh, is there something very satisfying from a motivational point of view there? Perhaps even getting into something like the flow state. The environment for sure, so any of those models that, are, that include environments such as ecological models. Behavioral economics, this sort of trade-off of time versus energy expenditure, I think is, is a critical one for us understanding these things. Um, and the argument from uh, Heath and Lieberman is that we should not assume that rationality uh, is at work here. Uh, and I think in a lot of the research I've been engaged over the years uh, and, and others that, uh, yeah, it's pure folly for us to assume that rational processes are at play. Uh, and Lieberman would argue that we did not evolve to be rational in conditions of comfort and abundance. We evolved to be rational in conditions of no abundance. Uh, and so if I need food, I'm going to figure out how to do that. But now if I don't have to worry about that, uh, I'm not necessarily going to be rational about the activities I engage in. And now things like boredom, avoiding pain are going to be more uh, uh, important to me. So, and then some of the correlates that we know would be there, things like uh, age, I showed you already of that, gender, females tend to sit a bit more than males. Uh, type of employment is going to become critical. Uh, socioeconomic status, um, uh, we've done some work showing that uh, children living in lower socioeconomic status neighborhoods, so lower income neighborhoods, uh, tend to engage in more sedentary time, perhaps to avoid being outside where the conditions are not so great. Uh, so those would be some of the correlates related to it. All right, so let's see uh, an example of where I think you're going to see, and I definitely are going to see more of the interventions. Uh, this is some data from a chairless classroom study. If you, st if, you st if you just do a Google search on chairless classrooms now, you're going to see a bunch of stuff happening there. 
Uh, this is stuff which is almost ahead of where the research is, but you're reading about classrooms where they're changing them around. So this is energy expenditure here, the calories per minute, which I've shown you many different types of before. These are kids, the dotted line are kids in a chairless classroom, and then the solid line are kids in a classroom where they're sitting at a desk. Uh, and you can see that uh, this is right where our standing desk data was before, about 1.2 to 1.3 METs. Uh, and this is going across time. So uh, right across time, you can see that the kids in the standing desk condition are expending more uh, energy than the kids in the sitting desk. Why do you think, though, so up to about an hour to an hour and a half, we're, they're really uh, quite a big difference there. But why do you think, what's going on here now? We're getting into two hours now, and this is in the morning, uh, 8 to 10 a.m., what, what's going on in here, do you think, now? Any thoughts on why all of a sudden the gap has decreased a bit? I hear some whispers out there. Recess. recess. Well, recess may be coming, so I'm not sure. And so I even went back and looked at the study to determine if recess had happened. Maybe recess hasn't happened, but Junior has been sitting for two hours now on his table, and he's getting a little fidgety, probably. Um, so I, I'm thinking that's what happened here because they do not explain this sort of dramatic, uh, this, you know, this is even a steeper slope than the treatment group. They don't explain what happened there, but I'm suspecting it's just kids starting to get fidgety and moving around, which is actually a good thing. Probably not from a teacher's point of view, but from, again, our point of view, we want those kids to, kids to fidget and move all they can. So anyway, overall, the difference between the two groups is about 17% in terms of caloric expenditure, which would be pretty good. If you could accomplish that and maintain that over a, a year or so, you would start to see definite differences uh, in some of those uh, you know, mechanisms and so forth that I showed you before. So this is a chairless classroom. Took the chairs away from the kids. Um, uh, anything else I want to mention on that one? Yeah, OK. All right, so um, uh, Chu and colleagues, for those of you who are interested in trying to find those summaries of what the research has done, uh, this is a really neat thing. It was done in Australia. I quite like it. I would argue that it's probably, again, out of date now because you'll notice it's 2008. This is just when Healy was publishing uh, that first, uh, you know, one of those first studies documenting some of those uh, things that are going on there. So a lot of their stuff, I would argue, in here in terms of what we, where the evidence is, is, again, probably focusing much more on TV or trying to address television, so educational programs in school encouraging kids to not watch TV, for instance. And I think there's, there's more to it than, than that now. Um, okay, so here's the message based on what I've shown you to this point. Uh, that I think is a little bit different uh, than what we would have been talking about if I was doing this five or ten years ago. So, first of all, for those who can, because remember we're talking about people standing up now, and there is a proportion of our population who cannot stand. Uh, and I think there's sort of an ethical imperative for us there to, to understand what's going on for them too. But for those who can, we should stand at least one to two times per hour. That would go back to some of Healy's work. So you need to break it up. The idea here on the inactivity physiology, it's the long sustained sitting. So we need these sort of breaks, um, sort of almost like these little mini inoculations. Uh, so we need, uh, we want people to stand a couple of times at least an hour. Um, we want you to take a minimum of 5,000 steps. So that's going back to the Tudor Lock uh, uh, sedentary lifestyle index. Uh, so that would be implying that you probably are standing and moving around some more. Um, we want you to get outdoors. This is particularly with children. We know if there is one thing you could ask a parent about um, what their children do, if you want to know how active they were, is how much time they spend outdoors. It's, a, it's probably the best correlate that we have of how active children are. Um, and then the norm for sitting needs to be challenged. I see a few people in the back trying to challenge that norm now. We're in a big room with chairs, and you have the nerve to stand up. Um, and then settings. I think these are the three settings uh, that we have to focus on. You notice I don't have community in here, um, because I think the nature of the behavior we're talking about is, 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 is happening in some of these more immediate settings. Schools, workplaces, and homes. So I'm just going to touch on those quickly here. All right, so in schools, as I said, you just Google chairless classroom uh, stability ball with kids, and you'll get a million hits on these things. 
Um, so you know you've got the either the stability ball or you've got the standing desk or now there's this thing this one the kids still sitting but there's these learning mats I've just been reading about recently I think in those in the classrooms they're much bigger and the kids have to move around to them to do vocabulary and math type things I don't know if if there's any teachers or anybody in the education sector they can comment on this later but I think this is kind of a neat thing at the uh, kindergarten to early grades level um, so the idea is they're trying to incorporate this movement throughout the, the, the curriculum. Uh, recess, I mean, there's a war on against recess. We don't want that. You, you know, the, the, the graph I just showed you before, we gotta, we gotta get those fidgeting kids moving uh, even more. Um, so combination of the standing desk, the stability ball, so forth. One study showed that the costs of the uh, standing desk was about 20% more than a, than a a regular desk, chair-based desk, um, so you know that might be exorbitant to uh, to take on. Um, but I think there's some of these types of things. I I suspect that five, maybe ten years from now, uh, this will be more of the norm, and it may be the case that uh, it'll be required. Workplaces, another area where this is probably taking off again probably ahead of where the research is, but uh, lots of stuff. There's companies, uh, there's a whole industry targeting this, so the, the standing uh, desks, the adjustable desks, those types of things. Walking meetings are uh, another uh, neat one. And then how we get to and from work, and even when we are taking public transportation, standing versus sitting, for instance. Um, you know, I was just there was an article actually last weekend in the Globe about uh, sitting in the workplace, and the uh, so the uh, the uh, woman writing the the article was saying, yeah, you know, if if uh, sitting is the new smoking, then just about off every office worker is addicted uh, in cube land out there, right? So for many of you, you might have a luxury in the type of work you do that you're not restricted that way. But there's a lot of people who are working. You know, think about like in the you know the telephones and uh, the sales industry where they're sitting for much of the time. Uh, homes, uh, again, some of those types of things where it might not be so much reducing TV time per se, but it's the act of standing up as opposed to sitting down while you're consuming some of these things. Um, active transportation, getting kids involved in active play, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. And then for God's sake, walk the dog, you know. Uh, don't let him play with the Roomba vacuum that is going around in there. Um, and you know, there's, whoops, whoops, whoops. Just, there's, there's tons of these little energetic studies, so they tell us how much energy we expended when we used to wash clothes by hand as opposed to using the washing machine, blah, 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 blah. But you know, you add that up over time and there's uh, um, a few calories here and there that just keep getting knocked off. And again, we have some fairly powerful biological drivers that give us a pat on the back every time we come up with one of these inventions. Um, okay, so I just want to come finish now with the two points that I'm going to come. One, first of all, I want to talk about this act to play thing. So many of you probably can't read this. I apologize for that in the back. But a colleague of ours at, uh, Univers at Queen's uh, did a really neat, just published this paper in Canadian Journal of Public Health, and Ian Jansen, he's on the, um, the writing group with me for Active Healthy Kids Canada, so one of the people that, that develops that report card on children's physical activity every year. Uh, and what I liked that ne Ian did is he went and looked to see, okay, if we're going to improve the grades, so here's grades in a couple of categories, so in organized sport participation, active transportation, uh, physical education, and then active play and screen time. So these are the grades for those. Um, and he said, okay, if we're going to improve those grades, like if we were going to put a lot of effort in and improve that grade, how would it contribute to uh, the energy gap that we see there where we want kids expending more energy than they currently are? Um, and so if we got more, if we improved the grade and got more kids uh, in organized sport, we would improve that gap by about 1%. Could be pretty good at a you know national national level. Um, if we uh, you know got kids more active during physical education, because a big part of physical education is instruction, and kids are not necessarily moving. Um, or if kids were in physical education every day, uh, we might improve that by four percent. But where the substantial improvement was, thirty-seven percent. Uh, was in active play screen time. So getting kids more involved in active play and reducing screen time. And in fact, the solution to screen time for children is active play. That is where we've seen the biggest drop off and shift. 
Active transportation and active play are the two biggest decreases that we've seen for children over the last 50 to 100 years in Canada. Uh, organized sport has stayed up there. In fact, it's even increased in the last probably 20 or 30 years. Uh, it's in these areas where we've seen substantial decreases. So what Ian has pointed out is, yeah, if we could change that, if we improve the active play grade, we would see uh, a, a huge move towards eliminating that energy gap. Um, and so I, I just like that analysis because it's taken this, this advocacy document in the report card and figured, okay, if we make some changes, so when we're talking to our government colleagues and if we were going to do some investments, uh, this is where we might get a, a good buy for our dollar. Okay, two points I want to mention and finish off with here. So um, hopefully um, maybe some of you are even thinking about this. So two places where I see gaps and challenges. Uh, one is how can we be sedentary and physically active at the same time? Is that possible? As Newton said, that, that's, not, that's impossible. You right now, Sean, are not being physically active. You're not moving. Okay, yeah, keep doing that, Sean. But uh, yeah, people sitting down here, you cannot be physically active right now, can you be? But in terms of a physical activity guideline, if you just do 30 minutes over the day, you will have been physically active. So this is one of the challenges for us. Uh, and I'm going to show you these big ugly tables, but I'm just going to talk to you real quick about it. This one is from a big accelerometry study published in the Journal of American Medical Association last year, or two years ago now, 2012, and it presents uh, one of the first challenges to this argument that there's independent effects, so the inactivity physiology. Uh, it's a big accelerometry study done around the world, almost 21,000 children that they had accelerometers on, uh, and what they basically showed, so I'll just bring you to a box here, when they looked at uh, moderate to vigorous physical activity and controlled for sedentary time, you saw a, uh, and if kids were more active and controlling for sedentary time, you saw a decrease in waist circumference, for instance, so there was a benefit of moderate to physical, physical activity on waist circumference, controlling for sedentary time. Fairly large effect there, actually. Uh, but when they looked at sedentary time and controlled for physical activity, uh, this effect was much smaller and in fact it's not significant if you, if you look at the confidence intervals here you need to see zero in the middle. So basically when they control for sedentary time they see a physical activity benefit uh, on waist circumference and it's the case all the way across here but then when they control for uh, physical activity and look at sedentary time that difference is uh, there is no benefit. Um, and the same thing I've shown you another effect for HDL so these are the good cholesterols we want uh, you see an increase in the HDLs for MVPA controlling for sedentary time, and you see no effect of uh, sedentary time on HDLs controlling for physical activity. Um, so this study, um, oops, this study uh, led these guys to conclude that it's the physical activity that's the important thing, and we need to promote physical activity as opposed to worrying about the sedentary time, or that would be the implication from this study. Um, so I'm going to. And then similarly, a study just published um, out of uh, Pennington in, um, in Louisiana, big, big research group there, again, using a big sample, again, with accelerometry type data. Uh, and basically, across all these figures, what you want to see is some sort of a linear pattern, but most of them are flat when you look across them. And in fact, none of these are significant. So what they're suggesting here is, again, when they look at, um, physical activity, uh, they see an impact on all of these different uh, mechanisms, but when they look at sedentary behavior controlling for physical activity, they see no difference between the lowest, uh, the least, or the most sedentary and the least sedentary groups, no significant difference. So this also has led this group to say there's virtually no association between sedentary behavior and cardiometabolic cardio biomarkers once analyses are adjusted for total physical activity. So these two studies recently published large data sets with accelerometry are challenging. It's not saying that sedentary behavior is, is not a problem, but what they're saying is that it can be ameliorated by exercising. Uh, whereas before the inactivity physiology, remember, says uh, it can't be ameliorated by exercise. This, stay tuned on these because there's going to be a big war now because there's interests on both sides. People have invested heavily, their research groups, the funding they have, and they will not. And in fact, you can go to this plus one article and there's commentary from the group that Healy was part of. And they're throwing darts at these guys. Uh, so um, it's, it's a battle of 
the truth, wherever that may be, and some of the interests, investments in it. So we sort of have to sit there and let some of this fall out, but it's, again, not saying that sedentary behavior is not bad, it's just what the solution to it is what's being challenged. Okay, so I'm actually gonna skip the biosphere, and I'm gonna skip this one. Okay, actually, no, I'm just gonna show you this one. The other, other issue that I think we have to deal with in terms of getting people to stand up more is something called behavioral compensation. So if we get you to stand up more, will you go home, let's say you stand all day at a standing desk, when you go home tonight, are you still gonna go for a jog or not? Uh, and that's, that's something that uh, we're not so sure might be happening. So in this study, uh, this is uh, showing that, remember that neat or that spontaneous or that low intensity physical activity that I told you before? In this study, what they were looking at was uh, if they got people to exercise, uh, what happened was these are the levels of the amount of time they spent in that neat or that spontaneous physical activity. So before they exercised, this is where they were at. Uh, and then this is a non-walking day. And then this is a walking day. And then this is post. So basically what you see is as we got people to walk a lot more, you saw a decrease in that little spontaneous physical activity. The one that I said that takes up most of the day, all that little stuff. So this is sort of a reverse compensation. We get people to exercise, we might decrease the low-grade activity. If we increase the low-grade activity, do we decrease the exercise? Because we want both of those things to be happening uh, together. We don't want people to compensate. Okay, so to finish off, uh, I've made this sort of evolutionary argument for where we've gotten to this point. Um, cultural uh, evolution has sort of taken over now uh, and presented some challenges to us. And the focus as a result is really about the environments that we're, uh, we're living in. If, if we're going to have effective interventions, um, we need to inform people that standing up and those types of things are important. But we also need to change uh, those settings in particular, the workplaces, schools, and, and the home setting. Uh, and I'm going to leave you with these questions that I think we need to ponder. Is there an independence between the two? Uh, Hamilton would argue that it's not just, and if you look at the commentary to the, on the Plus One website, the argument is coming back. It's not just the energy expenditure you need to be considering the, the, uh, the posture that people were in, and that study did not Control, did not have a measure of posture. They just had the accelerometry data. So they were just doing energy expenditure, the 1.5 METs. Um, should the definition include the intensity piece? Because I showed you a graph before where, you know, if you're, if you're sitting uh, down, you're getting nowhere near 1.5 METs. Uh, if we get people to stand more, do we decrease activity? So the behavioral compensation one. Uh, no guidelines for adults. I get that question all the time. Why are there no guidelines for adults? Um, uh, it's being worked on. Um, and then how do we bring on the next cultural revolution and have more people standing at the back of the room? All right, so I'll stop there, and thanks for your attention. And.